Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about some of the uh, work we've been doing at the OECD. Um, um, I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we've been learning about jobs and skills. Uh, we do a lot of work at the moment trying to understand really what's happening with all the jobs that are being gained, being lost, uh, but also some of the, I think, this, the needs we have in terms of skills. And we, we, I'll, I'll end with uh, pointing you to a couple of, uh, of, of, of our work uh, a little bit later on. Um, I wanted to start a little bit with figures, and, and one of the things I think people ex expect from the OECD, we typically put up some, some numbers just to basically get the debate going, but also I think because we, are, we believe in evidence and trying to get the evidence right. Um, and I think this is the type of work which you see in many places. A lot of people basically say, well, we need to understand how many jobs might be lost, how many might, jobs might we be, be changing, how many jobs might also be gained in the future. I think. It's a question we're all struggling with. We know that in the past as well, there has been a lot of disruption. Uh, if you look at previous industrial revolutions, usually a lot of jobs were lost, jobs were gained as well, but in the meantime, we had a lot of change and sometimes a lot of disruption where people had difficulties in, in, in moving forward. There are lots of estimates around at the moment, basically saying, well, how many jobs are being lost? I don't think that's really the point. I think we need to understand a little bit what's really going on here, what's really happening. And I think what's really happening is that Typically, what technology can do, it automates tasks. It automates specific tasks that people are doing. For instance, and many of us do lots of different tasks in, a, in our job, in our lives. Uh, some of those tasks can be automated. Other tasks are much harder to automate. Think about a gardener, somebody who does lots of different uh, tasks. Some parts can be automated, for instance, mowing the lawn. Other tasks probably can't be automated that quickly. And the question is a little bit, well, how many of these tasks can be automated? If you can have see many tasks being automated by technology, then typically we also see that a job might disappear uh, completely or might change a lot. Um, replacing a job totally is sometimes a lot harder than you think. There has been some interesting work from an American economist, James Besson, who basically looked at all the occupations that existed in 1950 in the United States and he found only one job that had completely disappeared, and that was the job of lift, uh, lift operator. So the person who would be standing in the lift and basically pushing the buttons for you and telling you about all the things that were happening in the building, that's the only job that had completely disappeared. Other jobs, a lot of them had perhaps shrunk, fewer of them, but most of them still existed. And I think, to some extent, that's what we, we, we're seeing. Uh, we see uh, jobs being lost, a lot of them being changed, but we also see a lot of new jobs being created. And I think that's the part of the story which we typically don't focus on that much, even though there are many opportunities around here. Um, we did a bit of work on that, looking at some of the numbers around that, and we found, for instance, that 40% of the new jobs being created over the past 10 years have been created in very digitally intensive industries. So industries with lots of technology being in place, but still lots of new jobs being created as well. And I think that's where some of the opportunities are uh, right now. And we see this as well if we look at the moment at job numbers in the OECD. The interesting thing is that even though we see all this technology coming our way, we see that employment rates and unemployment in many of the OECD countries are actually lower than they've been in a long time. So basically we have all this technology, but still more and more people have been coming into jobs, particularly older people, also women. So at the moment job rates are still uh, going, going up. So perhaps not the end of work yet, uh, at least at the moment, we don't see it happening. We still see more jobs being created than being lost. But it is something I think we need to, to, to watch. There's one other point I think we need to think about here, which is basically we're also dealing with very rapidly aging populations, in particularly some of our, our, our countries. Think about a country like Japan, for instance. One of the reasons why Japan is so much focused on robots is, in, is really investing so much in robots because of the very rapidly aging populations. They just don't have the people anymore coming through to take care of all the tasks which have to happen in the economy. And that's why there's so much investments in robots. And I think we will see the same happening more and more also in some of the other countries. The real issue, I think, is skills. That's the real challenge because the new jobs that are being created and they are being created are quite different than the ones that are being lost. They're typically less routine, they're more complex, they involve different tasks, which is why they're so hard to, to automate. Uh, they also, I think, require different skills, and that's where I think we need to focus on how do we get these new skills, these different skills that people need. These are not ICT skills alone. I think we often see in the debate as well that a lot of people say, well, we need more digital skills. Yes, I think we do. 
but also we probably need the more human skills, the real skills that actually differentiate what we do as humans from what computers can do. And those are things like teamwork, they're sort of really working uh, together with other people, creativity, uh, also things like problem solving. Those are some of the themes that things that make us human and differentiate us very much from, from the robots and, and from, from, from the technology. And that's, I think, what we need to, to focus on. Uh, learning to learn, another skill probably, uh, which is probably something we need to work on because if we need to develop these new technologies, we need to also uh, uh, work uh, on, on how we learn uh, for the future. The problem we have at the moment is, and that's why I think the fundamental challenge is that most of the training at the moment goes to people who already have a high level of skills. So most of the training goes to people with high levels of skills, most of the tra training goes to people who have a low risk of seeing their job automated, most of the training goes to people who are in more permanent sort of stable jobs compared to people who are in more unstable temporary jobs. So that's where I think we need to think about how we change that how we focus on, on, uh, on, on training. Um, we're doing quite a lot of work on, on looking at training systems across countries, and what we see at the moment, and particularly uh, the little one uh, you see on, on, the, uh, on, on the right, is basically saying we spend too little, uh, considering the scale of the problem, we spend too little on skills. Uh, we access to all, all of these training systems is quite limited. As I said before, it it's often goes to the people who already have the, 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 the right level of skills. It's often too costly for a lot of people. The access on, on getting these skills isn't really good enough. The quality isn't always very good yet, so we need to invest in that. And also, I think the information on what type of skills you need to get is, is sometimes quite limited. So there's a lot to do to develop these, these training systems and getting them right. Let me say one final word because before getting to a couple of things which we can do about all of this. Um, I think skills, training, if we're thinking about the transition to a digital economy where we really see some of the opportunities which are, are really there, lots of things would need to happen. Training is only part of that, but I think there are other parts of it as well, particularly if we want to make sure that people don't fall behind the wayside, don't fall behind. There are other things that need to happen, and one of those issues is also around social protection, making sure that the people who are probably more in marginal jobs also have some social protection, some employment protection, because at the moment, a lot of them have very little protection. So there are other issues there which I, I think uh, we need to think about, about the quality of jobs and, and what we really, uh, can help uh, people in, in that context. So let me end with a few things about, well, what can we do about this? Well, I think first we need to help make this transition to a different economy fair. We need to try and make sure that people have opportunities have opportunities to find a better job and to find a decent job going forward. And at the moment, I think we're not doing uh, well enough on all of that. Secondly, I think we need to focus the budgets, the training facilities that we have on the people who re most need them. And at the moment, it's just going the other way. We focus most of it really on, on people who don't necessarily need as much training as others. Thirdly, I think we need to think about the training which is, is needed. We need to think about the mix of skills that people need. Uh, we still need to, I think, think about the types of, of, of skills, uh, for instance, like the more human skills where we need to, to focus on. And that means we need to review the way our uh, education and training systems work. I think in, in the panel, we'll go in a lot more depth on that, but I think there's a lot to be done around that to make sure uh, we get the right types of, of, of training systems. I mentioned social and employment protection already because I think it's important uh, as well to, to think about. And finally, all of this, I think, is not something that governments can do on their own. It's not that business can do on their own. It's not something that uh, trade unions, it really is something that people will have to do together. I think we need to work together on this. And as some, some of the examples I see in some of the countries we work with, Sweden, Denmark, and others, is a lot of collaboration to try and say, well, how do we make people make this transition? How do we help them get through this, this process uh, to make all of this work. So, a lot to do. I don't think any of this is easy. Uh, I think this is one of the most difficult transitions we're going to be, be going through. But we have better systems in place than in the, few, in the past. So I think if you think about previous industrial revolutions, we didn't have a um, social security system. We didn't have some of the training system. We didn't have universal access to education. So there are things we can work with, but there is a big challenge here. And I think that's why it's really important to, to get this right. 
If you want to read more, uh, we have a lot of work on all of these issues, and I'll just leave you with a couple of, of things which you may find interesting. Uh, particularly our employment outlook recently was only focused on the future of work because I think we think this is a critical area to work on uh, in, in the future. So, thank you. It's a great opening, Dirk. Um, before I introduce the moderator, um, I was moderating another, another panel around the future of work, and someone said, um, my parents were trained in their lives to do one job. We have to train to do four or five different jobs during our lifetime. Our children will probably be doing five jobs at any given time, right? So what better topic to discuss than the skills that are required to actually do this change and this transition? And uh, I invite uh, Venus Ali to actually come over on stage and introduce the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much, Hugo, and thank you, Dirk. Um, I will ask all the other panelists to come up. Um, so today we're talking about um, evolution and of jobs and skills in tech. And actually, I think that's slightly misleading, that little in tech bit, because this goes so much wider than the tech sector. What we're seeing at the moment is the economy digitized. Um, technology is creeping in and disrupting every possible sector. And so this is really a conversation about how those skills and, and the jobs of the future, how do we make sure that they're open to everyone? So I will take a seat up here um, and I'll ask, perhaps starting with you, George, if everyone could just introduce themselves and perhaps say a little, a few words just about their background and why they're interested. Absolutely. So I head up the Insights team at Tech Nation. Uh, Tech Nation, in case you're not familiar with us, uh, looks to uh, essentially make the UK the best place to start and scale up a digital tech business. Uh, and in Insights, we produce a number of different reports to look at different aspects of how we can support that ecosystem, including jobs and skills, looking at areas like tech for social good, AI and cyber. We have growth programs, a learning platform, and we're also responsible as a designated competent body for the Tech Nation visa scheme. Uh, so we're looking to support tech scale-ups. Uh, previous to this, I was at Nesta um, within the Creative and Digital Economy team. And again, we had a great focus on education and skills. Hello everyone, my name is Kim Nilsson. I'm the CEO and founder of Pivigo, data science marketplace and training provider. Uh, my background is in science, I have a PhD in astrophysics, and I experienced just how difficult it can be to transition from academia into industry, which is uh, what led me to start the business Pivigo, where we try to work in this gap between academia and industry. Uh, we have two elements to our business. One is about the future of work, gig economy, freelance workers in, this, in the data science industry, connecting them to opportunities in companies. And the other side, which is also relevant for today, is that we run a training program for academics who want to retrain to become data scientists. So we run a program called Science to Data Science, which may come up in discussion later, where we have to date trained about 600 people to become data scientists. Um, good morning or good afternoon. I'm Jason Holt. I'm the CEO of, um, that's my mum, um, CEO of uh, Holt's Group. And we are a, a, sort of a group of companies that employ apprentices in, uh, in the augmented reality um, sector, in the, in the jewellery sector. And I also have trained apprentices for over 20 years. Uh, so I'm a flag bearer of the apprenticeship model to respond to Dirk's question of how do we address the skills issue uh, and I also chair what's called the Apprenticeship Ambassador Network, and it's an alliance in this country of employers who are enlightened, who are employers of um, large and small of apprentices, and have seen just the impact that apprentices have given them in terms of future-proofing their businesses. And this is a network that champion apprenticeships as a great model, and also it's a network of apprentices who go into schools Go, into, go to parents and actually try and enlighten them as to their first-hand accounts of just the impact they've had on their own careers as apprentices in, in changing businesses. So I'm delighted here to sort of give an apprenticeship view on, 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 the, on the subject. Hello, everyone. My name is Natasha McCarthy. I'm head of policy at the Royal Society, and that's the UK's National Academy for Sciences. Um, as part of our work in kind of promoting excellent science, 
uh, we do a lot of work to bring evidence to policy. Um, so we have a significant policy section. And I lead in particular our work on data and digital policy. So at some points during the talk, I'll probably wave around the sorts of publications that we create. Um, but we've looked at things like uh, the impact of machine learning on the UK economy, the barriers to kind of take up and the opportunities for those technologies. We've looked at things like data governance, uh, looked at privacy and security of data, and looked very recently at the impacts of AI on work and the kind of changes in the demand for data science skills. Thank you very much. And my name is Venus Ali, so I head up the policy team at Tech UK, which is the trade association for the UK's tech sector. We have over 900 members, um, ranging from the very large to the very small. Um, and we're all about sort of making sure that the opportunities for tech are there for everyone to grasp. Um, I've slightly pivoted my chair so that I can see the panel better, not that we've not got a beautiful audience in front of us. Um, so, George, if I could start with you. We've heard what the, what the view is from um, at an OECD level. Mm. From a UK perspective, is that you know, similar to what we're seeing here, or is there slightly points of differentiation, and if so, why? Yeah, so I mean, the perspective I would take is on tech, but we wouldn't just look at the tech sector. Uh, as an organisation, we're interested in digital transformation of traditional industries as well as non-tech sectors. So when we look at jobs and skills, we're thinking about the digital economy. Uh, we're looking at digital jobs within digital tech companies, non-digital jobs like HR or accountants within tech companies, and then digital tech jobs outside of that. So think about a software developer within Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, and, and actually, I can give you a sneak peek of some of the research that's going to be published on Thursday at our event at the Barbican. Uh, we found that actually 2.1 million people are in employment in the digital economy at the moment in the UK. So it's making a massive contribution as we currently stand. But we've actually seen that <coughs> vacancies have grown up to 100% um, in, in some regions across the UK. Belfast, in fact, uh, we've seen a 120% increase in vacancies over the last four years. Um, and when we refer to vacancies, we're thinking about advertised jobs. And we've worked with Adzuna, and there's 70 million rows of data in order to do this. Um, we're not just thinking about new job openings. We're also thinking about churn through those jobs, speculative job advertisements for companies that are hiring very quickly and want to suss out the talent. And there also may be some degree of duplication if jobs are hired or if jobs are advertised throughout the course of the year, though Adzuna obviously do their best to deduplicate that data. And what we've seen is a massive increase in both uh, the skills that are demanded from employers that relate to jobs like a full stack developer, software developer, data scientist, uh, but also non-tech roles like consultants and project managers within uh, the tech sector. It's important to note, though, that these jobs aren't just about technical skills, and that's not the only way these jobs are able to add value to tech companies. You have to have a real combination of both technical skills, but also non-tech skills, and, and Dirk mentioned some of them. It's around persuasion, negotiation, communication. Uh, it's having empathy and being able to, I guess, communicate in a way that is relevant to stakeholders that you're communicating with. Uh, and in our report, we actually break that down on a regional basis and allow us to look at where, for instance, jobs are rising most in particular areas of, of, of occupational activity uh, and what that means in terms of the skills that individuals need. Uh, so do take a look at that when it comes out. Absolutely well. And so, I mean, really, that's the, the growth we're seeing in the UK is, is enormous. Um, and the skills are very different. Natasha, how does that compare to, I guess, the industrial revolutions that we've seen previously? Question. So um, here's one of my little reports I'll wave around. This is a piece of work we did with the British Academy for Humanities and Social Sciences, looking at the impact of AI on work. And in this work, we looked at all the different kind of projections around how jobs and skills will change as a result of a take up of AI. But we also looked at what's happened in the past, different kind of periods of technical change. Oh. Is that better? Can you hear me? So, um, yes, so in this work on uh, the impact of AI on work, we looked at um, the different kinds of projections that are around at the moment about how AI will change jobs, but we also looked at kind of past periods of technological change. Um, and I suppose the kind of, there's a couple of main messages. One is that um, the benefits of new technologies do tend to come, but they don't come immediately. 
So there's always, as Dirk pointed out, this period of transition where you have to kind of adopt new technologies, you have to kind of prepare the workforce, and you're going to see various different effects. And through various technological changes, what we've tended to see is that the most kind of vulnerable in society, people who are in their lower skilled jobs, uh, with less kind of flexibility for their work, are the ones who are most adversely affected through technological change. So that's something to be really kind of aware of, um, that the, we know who tends to get affected, and it's those people who are possibly less able to kind of deal with those changes. So we have to think about that. But what's really important to know is that um, when we did this work, we talked to lots of different researchers, and there was a really nice phrase that came out, which was that technology is not a unique and overwhelming force. And that's to say that the way that technology will change jobs is not sort of determined by the nature of the technology. It's not about a question of an unfolding of kind of changes in the workforce based on the technology that you um, bring about. Um, and so, for example, looking at, it, at the use of automation technologies in the 60s and 70s in the oil industry, the same technology used in the same industry in different countries would have different impacts on jobs, um, organisational structures and the skills needed. So there's not one way that kind of technologies will change jobs and skills. And so what that means is not just a question of, kind of the evolution of jobs and skills, it's a question of the management of that change and how we kind of design our working processes, how we design our organisations, and importantly, how we design our kind of skill strategies and our retraining strategies to enable people to adjust to those changes mm -hmm. and for all people to kind of have the benefit of using these technologies for their working life. And I guess, I mean, that's, that's a very academic overview. Yeah. Um, Jason, Kim, you're both on the ground industry leaders. Um, you know, from, from your perspective, what are the sort of challenges um, that you're facing in terms of recruiting the right skills and talent? And, and what are the barriers actually for people to come into that field? Jason, perhaps we can start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a business, and as a businessman, I want to get the best talent. And I think every businessman in the, in the land would say, what I want are the best people. Uh, and the, the misnomer is that we have, you know, you walk through COGX, you've got this group of people, and there is transformation, there's disruption in all industries. And yet, if you look at the education sector and you look at the way in which uh, the best opportunities and jobs are found, it's still sort of in its old hat. It's decades old. It's, in, it's hundreds of years old, in fact. So why is there not the same disruption in education and the way we find jobs? Um, uh, as, as there are in everything else. I think that is the opportunity, and the good news is that there's, you know, we are at the cusp, I think, of a revolution. I think, you know, the, I'm not a, a government spokesperson, but I've been working very closely with uh, seven ministers, and now possibly the eighth minister, on kind of skills policy uh, to make uh, certainly apprenticeships and technical training work for business. And I think, you know, with that disruption almost uh, at our doorstep, we can sort of be much more... Um, intuitive how we source talent. So I'm delighted as a business to be able to hopefully take on more apprentices to grow my business. Apprentices have a great journey in front of them in terms of being part of, of, of a dynamic organisation. But, but to pick up on the, the softer skills, the, you know, we have relied so heavily for, for over you know, <coughs> decades on the, uh, on the university sector. I have uh, 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 one daughter in university and another about to go to university, and it's, for, for them it's great, but actually for many it is not great. They don't necessarily come out of university with the skills, particularly those sort of problem-solving, team-leading, communication, um, those kind of uh, creative, agile skills that, 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 we, that Dirk and George have been talking about, and I think that is what um, I've seen happen in, with apprenticeship, apprentices, that they really come out with, you know, they're part of the team, they're learning off the job as well as on the job, and they're learning those skills as part of it, and it's uh, coming out with a much better sort of type of talent for, for, for businesses, in my, in my opinion. And, I mean, and Kim, you're, you are disrupting that model in terms of, you know, Pivigo training sort of academics to go into business using a five-week intensive course, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. What, what does that, you know, do you think that model can be applied more broadly? Um, and, do you, and what do you think sort of is attractive about that model for people who, as Hugo said in his introduction, will have much more than just one career in their lifetime, but probably into the sort of half a dozen or more? Yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, as, oh God, where do we start with challenges in our industry? There are so many. Uh, and actually, maybe following on Jason, maybe turn the spotlight around on us employers, companies that are looking to hire 
Um, the reason we started our training program now six years ago was because we were talking to companies and they said, we can't find analytical talent, they don't exist. And I'm an academic, uh, astrophysicist, as I said, STEM background. I had loads of friends who were telling me, I can't find a job, no one wants to hire me. And so there was a very clear mismatch there between the incredible talent that we do have in our universities, coming out of university, and employers not understanding the skills. So I think that was the first challenge really, was to get employers to understand that if you have a PhD in computational biology or astronomy or even psychology, you can be a data scientist straight away, um, maybe just with a little bit of fine tuning of, of, uh, of your skills. So, um, so that was the reason we started the program. And, uh, and we made it very short because we knew it was literally just about basically polishing up the profile of these people who had great skills but for some reason just wouldn't manage to get hired. Um, and that's worked really well and in that five week period, um, actually the greatest challenge for these academics leaving academia is the culture shift. It's not about technical skills, it's about, it's about understanding how to work in a business environment in terms of deadlines, in terms of communication in terms of teamwork, all of these soft skills that they're not used to and which actually really is a big culture shock to them when they do come onto the program and when they do start to work with companies. Um, similarly, the employers need to match their expectations to what's out there uh, and welcome that talent in and be cautious in how to manage it because you cannot manage it the same way you ma manage a, a business graduate, etc. Um, but coming back to your question also on uh, is this a model that could work uh, for later stages in life? Absolutely. Um, you don't need a degree to be a data scientist. Anyone in the room, no matter what background you have, I could turn you into a data scientist in a couple months of your time. Uh, and you don't, even, you don't need to go to university. You, you just need to have the dedication and the time, put in the time and work through various tutorials, etc. But also to remember that we don't all need to be super technical experts to work in this industry either. This industry also requires loads of business managers and people who can work in that space where they understand analytics and understand business or understand the organization they work in. So there are opportunities for everyone and I think uh, these sort of short, agile training courses where from one year to the next we can change the curriculum to whatever employers need at that year um, are, are absolutely the way to go. Not university. I'm, Sorry. I'm going to absolutely take you up on that offer of turning me into a data scientist because <laughs> I am probably one of the most mathematically challenged people you'll meet. So if you can do it for me, then um, there's hope for us all. But that, I mean, the, the, you mentioned culture and sort of changing the culture of businesses, etc. But I wonder, Natasha, if actually as a society and as a, the UK needs to change its culture in terms of we still see school, school as the end of our learning pathway, whether that happens at the age of 16 or whether that happens at university. And if so, how do we create a culture that accepts that we do need to train and retrain and relearn throughout our lives? It's a really good question. So um, one of the things that we're doing here at the Royal Society is uh, thinking about how we change education. Um, and we have a nice expression which is about a broad and balanced curriculum. Uh, and the view is that if people start off their kind of um, educational journeys by taking a really broad kind of set of subjects across, across quantitative skills and more kind of humanities and social science focused uh, subjects, they have a better grounding for a, a kind of broader range of careers throughout their kind of lifetime. So if you have that much more broad um, educational foundation, then you're in a better place to reskill through your career. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to think about. We have always had, particularly in the UK, quite a sort of siloed approach to education. You either specialise as somebody who's a scientist and a quantitative person, or you specialise as somebody who's much more kind of in the kind of humanities and social sciences. But we need to break that down so people can move more swiftly across those different areas. Um, <coughs> And we did some particular research similar to the work that George was talking about. We particularly looked at data science and data science skills. Um, and we saw some you know, fascinating figures about the kind of growth in demand for these skills. So, uh, for example, between 2013 and 2018, a 1,287% increase of job, in job openings for data scientists. Um, and that just shows that these jobs, which are quite sort of rigorous and analytical, 
um, they are becoming more and more important. So they've got to become less and less specialist. Uh, data science and other data jobs are going to be coming up across all different sectors. So we have to stop thinking of data, data skills as a specific set of skills. Uh, data science is for everyone. So we've seen lots of examples of cases where um, data skills are embedded in different sorts of subjects, and social science subjects in particular. And I think, again, breaking down this sort of divide between the kind of more quantitative and more qualitative sides of education, understanding that in order to meet this kind of growing demand for data science skills, you've got to bring them into the education of everyone is really important for giving people that foundation for learning and that ability to reskill re and take the jobs of the future. Dirk, tell us it's not just us, it's not just the UK that's got this awful, you know, mindset that, that sort of pigeonholes us early on and doesn't let us so easily change careers. Tell us it's, it's not just us. It's not just us. Yeah, no, it's not actually, <laughs> just not, uh, no, I think this is an, an, an issue which basically every country we're looking at faces in some way or the other. And probably what we're seeing at the moment is some countries I think are doing more in terms of trying to figure out what to do about it, how to move forward, and, and we see some... Uh, I think interesting examples of, of approaches uh, being developed in, in certain countries. I'm, I'm, my, my own country isn't too bad. I'm from the Netherlands originally. I think we're doing pretty well on things like apprenticeships and, and, and technical training, which, which Jason was talking about. Uh, but I think we're seeing lots of things happening, for instance, in a country like Sweden, where there's a lot of collaboration between basically business and, uh, well, employers, employees, and, and, and often the government to try and sort of figure out, well, what can we do to make sure that people are not being, being, being lost, uh, are not falling behind? I, I think where probably my perspective is a little bit different from, from the, the, the business perspective, I think business will always focus on the talent it needs, and, and that's absolutely essential, and it's really important. But I think from a policy perspective, you also need to think about the people who are probably not going to be as much in demand by, by some of the tech businesses, and that's where you also need to focus on the people who are probably likely to lose their jobs, who may be, 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 be sort of losing out in the process, and that's where a lot of the focus will need to be, at least from a policy perspective. I think you need to work with business to try and develop that new talent, but you also need to try and figure out what you can do for, for people who are probably going to be losing their job, and, and that will happen. I think that's, you know, that's... I grew up in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, I'm, I'm a farmer's son. Uh, there used to be 100 farms between the two villages where I grew up. There are three left now. So basically, there's been lots of restructuring there. And I think we've seen that in many different parts of the world. You just, but you need to move on. And I think that's where the training side and the skill side is so important, to try and work on that much earlier, to prepare people for a life where they might be doing lots of different things, and to develop new types of skills. So I, I agree with lots of what's been, been said on the panel. We, we need to develop that. We really need to build these adult training systems, because at the moment, they just are not good enough. And I mean, Jason, on apprenticeships, they, they are often seen as um, you know, something for people coming directly out of school, but actually, they can be much broader than that. I wonder if you've got any yeah. experiences of, sort of adults retraining via apprenticeship. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, just in terms of your earlier question as well about challenges, one of the biggest challenges is in this room, I wonder how many people would consider what an apprenticeship is. Uh, I would imagine, I mean, just hands up those who uh, consider apprenticeship being about manual trades, about being kind of electricians and plumbers, just as a matter of interest. Sort of. Okay, a small smattering. So that we, ha we have an enlightened audience, but the majority of, of employers have this sort of fixed sort of image issue that uh, uh, being an apprentice or taking on apprentices for kind of more sort of um, vocational trades rather than actually what is now for every single profession, from law to accountancy to, uh, to data science to, um, to programming, has an apprenticeship pathway in it. So I think there is a mindset challenge, which is, employers understanding that this is for everyone at all levels, from a very basic level all the way through to PhD level. So that's a big challenge. How do you get that across? Partly, I'm here in order to be able to, to share that with you. The other mindset challenge, I think, is, is our parents. Because if we've just heard from Kim to say that actually you don't need to go to university, that in, in a few weeks, in five weeks, you could be a great value and have a great <coughs> career in, in AI, then actually there, you know, that opens up a huge amount of social mobility, inclusivity opportunities. So, so actually, the, my message isn't go, don't go to university. I'm just my message is actually there is an option outside university, and, and I think we just as parents and 
as parents myself, I have to be open to the fact that my children might be better to, to go through a, a work-based learning route, through an apprenticeship route, for example, rather than go straight to university and then wonder, you know, at the end of you know, having lots of debt and not necessarily uh, the opportunities of, 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 of a job, that actually there is, a, there is a good route for them. So I haven't really answered your question, which is my own um, experience in terms of, of people already in jobs. So the majority of apprentices are actually already in jobs, about 60% of the one million apprentices in this country uh, are already in employment. They are kind of already kind of, some could be senior management and they are doing an apprenticeship in, in a management for leadership, for example. So it is actually a misnomer that it's just for new entrants. So we have a very enlightened audience, clearly, but I wonder how many people knew that statistics. How many people thought that 60% of apprentices today had already had work or were in jobs? And I, and I think that sort of speaks to the, yeah. we need to change the narrative. Um, of this. Yeah, George, do you think that the, this government or any future government has that ambition to re I mean, this is a huge, this is not a, a problem that, as Dirk said, that the industry can fix itself and, mm. and we will need, you know, money, we'll need more spending in this area, but is there that ambition there, do you think? I mean, you work very closely with government, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely, um, the ambition is there. Um, we work closely with the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, as well as other government departments, and they've been doing an awful lot to think about uh, the need for digital skills uh, as the economy changes. Um, but really importantly, uh, they've set up uh, a number of, uh, I guess, more localised digital skills partnerships, uh, because I think the point that Natasha made about um, I guess the future of work not looking uniform uh, across any <coughs> geography, but, but given that we're thinking about the UK, it's certainly not going to look uniform across the UK. Uh, we need to be thinking about both local labour markets as well as national labour markets and thinking about how we meet skills needs in a more nuanced way. I think it's all well and good having a debate at a national level and thinking about the sort of policy levers that we can pull at a national level in order to help with uh, the sort of skills that are needed for the future, but actually when it comes to implementation and understanding, uh, we need to be thinking about that at a far more fine-grained level. Uh, I'd also say that I think a really useful shift in rhetoric is around the use of the term skill rather than thinking about careers or jobs. Uh, for me, in doing this analysis with our team, um, it's actually uh, important that we're thinking about jobs as packages of skills, behaviours, abilities, rather than thinking about jobs as fixed entities. And of course, it's important to understand how skills sort of flow in and out of different types of jobs. Uh, because a title may stay the same, but it's likely to be a very different job to what it was five years ago, even if it has a very similar name to it. Um, so what I'd urge people to do is think more about skills, because that then becomes a very practical, actionable thing that people can pick apart uh, and learn in a more incremental way. Um, it, it is very important to continue thinking about particular disciplines when we're thinking about full-time education, for instance. But I think when it comes to upskilling, reskilling, thinking about topping up on particular areas uh, in order to make uh, oneself more appropriate for particular types of jobs or industries, uh, then some of the initiatives that uh, organisations like Code First Girls are doing are, are really incredibly good because they're focusing on particular skills areas. Uh, and certainly can speak from example there because our data design manager, Lucy, at Tech Nation, went straight out of A-levels into Code First Girls and then got a job with us. Um, and for me, it's about having diversity of backgrounds and diversity of thinking within the team. Uh, Kim mentioned, we have um, a, a PhD uh, grad who came out of a degree in experimental psychology working as a data, la data analyst for us as well. So that mix is what I think uh, really enriches teams and organisations. And I'd love to see more of that and more of a conversation around skills. And I mean, yeah, please. I uh, personally love people who've, who've made career transitions. I, I'm one of myself, obviously. I've gone from science into entrepreneurship and running a business. In, in my business myself, um, our two developers, one had a music background and, and was a musician. The other one uh, was a lawyer and both reskilled to become software developers because that's suddenly what they realized they wanted to do in life. Um, and we've had, we have loads of scientists who've changed jobs and, and other people who've ch changed careers. People go through our program. We've, we've had an opera singer who mm. became a data scientist through our program. And, and what I love about people who do this is that when you, dis when you make that choice to change your career and to train a new, learn something new later in life, it means that you have a great motivation. It means you've really said, this is what I love to do. I'm passionate about this. I'm going to spend time and energy to, to make this transition. And for me, that's the best sign ever. I mean, I, I, I love to hire these people because 
they've made a very conscious choice about the career they're in. And then we should welcome that. We should make it easy for people to do that and to say, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump from my safe haven that I know and I'm going to try something new because I think I'll like it. So society really should encourage that every way we can. So I, I guess the question then, and, and this is to anyone who wants to jump in, is how do we motivate people? It's, you know, these... It goes back to Dirk's point of actually those who are going on retraining schemes and upskilling themselves now are probably those who are most motivated, who are the easiest to reach, who are actively going out and seeking um, courses, whether that's, you know, Kim's Pivigo, Fire Pivigo, or um, whether through the Holtz Group. So how do, you, how do we motivate more people to actually, you know, reignite their passion for learning? Natasha. So I didn't want to just say about how we motivate people, but actually it's not just about motivating people, it's about being strategic, right? So um, we, in our report on dynamics data science skills, we call for the kind of national data strategy to take a joined up approach to the skills and learning. Because um, what we need to do is understand how we're going to meet these skills needs. Now we've got brilliant data on the sort of openings for jobs, but what we found was there's not amazing data on the availability of skills. So we don't really know the sort of skills gap in any specific detail. So if we want to kind of have this kind of program of people um, retraining and taking the opportunities, we need better evidence and a better more strategic approach to understanding the, both the skills demands and the skills supply so we can give people good advice and good evidence and take a joined up approach to kind of bringing people into these different opportunities for reskilling. Um, so it's not just about motivating individuals, it's about taking quite a strategic approach and giving good advice to people. George, I saw you nodding your head furiously at the end there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I totally agree. And for me, it's, 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 uh, motivation is obviously incredibly important, but for me, it's about information in the first instance. <laughs> Because I just don't, I still think there are sort of asymmetries of information where employers are asking for particular types of skills and people who are either looking for jobs or going through the education system or maybe thinking about a transition in career, they're not necessarily aware of all of those skills. Um, so I think, first of all, it's about information, trying to level the playing field and get a shared understanding of the skills required for our future and the future of the economy. And then I think that will facilitate motivation. But of course, that's not going to be the end of it. And I think it's really important um, what Dirk said about this sort of coalition um, of government, industry, uh, entrepreneurs, um, other organizations um, actually coming together to think about what the future might look like and leveraging the resource across these quite different players uh, to think about how we position ourselves best for that future. And it's clear we're going to have to look internationally to see you know, examples of best practice elsewhere. Dirk, is there any signposts or tips you can you know, give us where we should be looking? I think everybody is trying to figure out the same problem and the same, same issue. So I think there, there are bits of, of things which I think are working. Uh, there are bits of where, where countries, I think, are trying to develop new things. One, one example, I think, when you're thinking about training, one of the issues is when you move from one company to another, well, how do you get your training cert certified? How do you, can you train, bring your, your training along? So what you see in some countries is something called individual learning accounts, where basically you can take your, uh, you're basically being certified for the fact that you agreements work together to try and sort of help the workforce in the sector to basically develop new skills. So, so I think we, we see bits of this in happening in different countries. There's lots to learn uh, from each other because I think, and, and of course they never work exactly in the same way. You always need to look at the institutional arrangement and how it works in different countries. But there's a lot of inspiration, I think, out there which we can all look at and, 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 and learn from. So I, I think we, that's, that's what's needed. I think there's a lot of need for experimentation as well, uh, for, for trying things, for, for for trying new approaches and then try to see the, the ones that, that work, uh, let, let's scale them. Let's, let's try to make sure they become big, they, uh, more and more people uh, use them. So, but I, because that's the way, I think, to, to grow some of the new opportunities around here. Uh, just in terms of motivating, I, I'd love to see a kind of a, a group of kind of A players who are role models who are going into society. You know, you're opera singer, you know, McKim, or, 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 or you know, those that are um, you know, clear successes. You know, the Bill Gates of the world, who you know clearly have you know have embraced AI and data science in their own way and, and huge successes, but role models like those, but people who are accessible to young people 
and to really celebrate them and to go into schools, go to communities, um, talk at events like this. So they can be, I suppose, give hope and motivate those that sort of may want to think about a, a career change, for example. And so that, I mean, that really signals to me that as an industry, we've got a lot to do to actually make the case that a career in tech or a career in digital is open to everyone. And I think, you know, if I can sort of pitch in as well as, um, as moderate, it's really about if we're going to do that, we need to stop fishing in very small ponds and we need to make sure that the pipelines that we're building are diverse and inclusive. And it's really sad to see so many women being turned off STEM subjects so early on in their um, education and I wonder if anyone's got any idea of how we change that. Clearly role models going into schools is, is a key factor but is there anything else we can be doing or should be doing? I think, I think that has to start early on and um, as uh, actually being a Swede <laughs> and growing up in, in Sweden which is one of the most equal countries in the world um, and then coming here and seeing, seeing how children are treated here, I'm actually quite shocked. And um, th this, this no notion that girls and boys are different, and you're, you're taught that from, from toddler age in this country. Why do you still have a system where, where you separate girls and boys in school? I don't understand it. Why would you point out to someone that you are different from them? Uh, I mean, imagine that we'd have segregated schools where white people would go to one and black to another. You would never accept that today. Um, but still we do this, and at the same time, of course, we tell girls, you can do whatever you want, you can, you can be the same as a boy, well then, why are we not having the same education? I, I, I'm, I know I'm, I'm being a bit facetious here, but I, I think that we start from early childhood telling girls that you are different from boys, you should behave differently, you should wear different clothes, you should be interested in different things, and it unfortunately just seeps through the whole way. Um, what can we do about that? Well, it's, it's culture, it's incredibly difficult to change, but what, what I do find is important is that we talk about it. And, and again, similarly, we recently launched our business in Germany, so now for the last year I've been traveling to a lot of events in Germany. Debate is very different. And whereas here in the UK, I was getting, a little, honestly, I was getting a bit annoyed by all these events I'm invited to, to talk about women in tech and, and diversity and so on. I was like, we just talk, we never do anything about it, we're just talking. I was getting frustrated. And then I go to Germany and, and there's no debate. And they are actually, Apologies for any Germans in the room. Uh, German, Germany is even behind in diversity work. And I realized that actually just talking about it actually does change things. Because the fact that the debate, the debate is constant means that it's on everyone's minds. And therefore, companies, for example, are making changes to how they recruit. Uh, education makes changes to how they uh, pitch their, their uh, education. Uh, we have things like Code Girl. Um, Code Girls. Code Girls. Code yeah. Girls. <laughs> uh, initiatives like that that are really making an, an impact on this stage. So the, the debate is good, and sometimes you get frustrated by it, but actually, slowly, slowly, we do start to wear down, chip down on those prejudices that do exist in the market. Do I actually want to start? No, no, just, a, just a few points. I, I think one of the, the interesting things at the moment is if you look at academic qualifications, women at the moment in many countries are doing a lot better than men. So I think that's changing, but. The, the problem is still that fewer women go into uh, sort of some of these areas, and then when they are do go in, a lot of them drop out much earlier on. And so, in a sense, that there is this pipeline which doesn't seem to work very well. And 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 I guess I mean yeah, the, the culture is one thing, but don't forget if we look back historically. I mean, if you look at the film Hidden Figures about sort of the, the women who did sort of the. Uh, the software for the Apollo landings and everything, it was all women. And, and you know, it, it, this is not something which is sort of, it, these, we can shape these things, we can change these things. And I think that's, that's something to keep in, keep in mind. So we need to look at really what's happening, why are women dropping out, why are, what are some of the opportunities, what's, what's really happening in all of this to, 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 to change that. And um, I come from a country too where um, it's looking at sort of, um, uh, men and women in different schools, at least where I come from, is really, really strange. Uh, but also, unfortunately, we know, don't do very well in, in, in this area and gender equality uh, as well. So, a lot's to be done there as well. And, George, is that, I mean, you spoke about how actually as the digital economy is growing, it's not mm. just about sort of software developers, etc., but it's about project managers. And so, do you think we need to do a better job at sort of saying actually a career in tech or a career in digital is, is far more than just coding? and Absolutely. doesn't actually need to be coding at all. 
Yeah, I think that's incredibly important, and that's really where we're coming from with this report that we're publishing on Thursday. It's actually tech is incredibly open and inclusive, but at the moment doesn't seem quite that way because the information's not there for people to make an informed decision about it. Uh, we conducted some research about a year ago um, looking uh, through a survey, but also we scraped Reddit posts, about 80,000 Reddit posts, to understand how young people felt about tech careers. And of those young people that wanted a career in tech, 30% uh, were women, uh, were young women, and 70% were young men. Um, and we made some really quite fine-grained recommendations specifically for scale-up companies that are closest to us in our network. Um, and we feel that if those sort of recommendations, like using uh, gender-neutral language, as well as using a very broadly neutral language in advertising jobs, um, is implemented, then we can start to nudge at it from the sort of business perspective. But I think, of course, uh, culture is incredibly pervasive, as Kim has said, and it's notoriously difficult to change. So we'll need a number of different nudging-type activities right through that pipeline. And in some cases, it may be far more than a nudge. Um, uh, in order to stimulate an environment that is truly inclusive. We can start to do things to uh, level the playing field, but until we have a culture that reflects that, um, which it may not if we don't do things to change it, um, we're not going to be in a place that we want to be for the future. Jason, can I ask you, I mean, apprenticeships, that's clearly, or it should be, a way to make sure that that pipeline is more diverse and inclusive, not just from a gender perspective, but also in terms of getting, um, you know, ensuring social mobility, etc. I wonder if you could speak to that it's, a little. It's a, it's a great question because uh, yes is the answer. The kind of, when we've talked about it as a panel, that the kind of people we would like as apprentices are, are more likely to come from a background where they haven't quite fitted into academia. And so that might be that, from a social mobility point of view, I mean, some of our best people have come from, from, from you know, non-academic, sort of more disadvantaged backgrounds. So it's a great tool for social mobility. Um, but, but interestingly enough, I was just thinking about the, the current focus at the moment in government is around older apprentices, you know, uh, uh, mothers who are returning to work. Um, and it, it, a lot of, you know, the majority of people in tech are of a certain age or much, much younger, and actually I don't see why, particularly given, given this, uh, this, this idea of this five-week program, why older people can't be included into this, this, this revolution in, in AI and, and data science. Yeah, and I mean, as Tech UK, we have a returners hub, which I'll just give a shout out to here, which is specifically spotlighting those companies that help women or anyone who's really taking a career ba break to get back into a sector that previously perhaps they'd never considered. Um, but, you know, that will actually be put into a company that will help support them on that journey. And I think that's a really key point that actually, if we are going to talk about retraining and reskilling throughout life, we're all going to be working until we're 70, if not older. So we need to be open to that. I mean, and Natasha, is there anything, I mean, in terms of the adult education budget, which has been sort of really cut back in, over the last decade or so, Beyond that, what else is there that we can do in terms of making sure that we are looking at the pipeline, not just sort of upwards, but from those who are well established in their careers at the moment? It's a really good question, and I think that, um, um, as Dirk pointed out, what tends to happen is that the established processes of having kind of continual professional development are in the jobs that are kind of highly skilled and well paid anyway. Um, so we do need to think about making sure that that kind of um, natural reskilling in the job happens across all sorts of jobs. So it's not a question of individuals having to take time out and stop their careers and restart them. And um, there are lots of jobs where you always have to keep upskilling. Well, why don't we make that sort of more of a normal kind of practice? So I think that's a really important thing to think about. But something I guess we haven't talked about, which I don't know if it's particularly relevant to this question, is just the movement between sectors. So people tend to stay in one sector. Do they stay in like academia, industry, etc.? Um, and I think you know, as people kind of move through their careers, they've got more they can do across different sectors. So thinking about how people could move between different sectors, even later on in their sort of um, careers, I think is really important because that's the way that we make sure that skills move around to the places that they need to be. And that I. Mean, I that's essentially implying that what we need is not just careers advice in our schools, but actually careers advice for adults. And Kim, I wonder if you've got any sort of thoughts on, on what that might look like. Where would people go to get that careers advice? It comes back to, I guess, George's point earlier about, well, you know, we need to signpost people better. Well, actually, that's a very interesting question. First of all, I was again shocked when I learned a few years ago that there is no careers advice in schools in the UK. You, you just don't get it. 
you have to figure out yourself. Uh, and uh, okay, admittedly, careers advice in my school when I was a teenager wasn't great, but at least it was there and it made you think about what do you want to do with your life. Um, I think, and, and I've been involved with Tech UK as well, and we've talked about this as well, as where, where do people go to find information about what could I do with my life? What, what could I do? How do I get there? Uh, we talked about role models has come up on the panel from Jason, um, and uh, Tech UK did a series of Big Data Heroes, uh, which was also a way of just showing people who are in different types of roles, because data scientist isn't one job, there's you know, a plethora of different types of job within this area. Um, so looking at different roles, where did they go? Where, where did they start? How did they end up where they are? Uh, of course, with mix of women and men, and, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it was a small campaign, but and and what would be great to see is a larger campaign um, where a larger organisation, if it is government or if it is an NGO of some sort, uh, taking charge of a larger campaign around. Um, Ideally, in this digital age, I suppose a platform or you know a, a website where you could go on and basically uh, learn more about career paths, learn more about what can you do. It's never too late to reskill. There are apprenticeships you can apply for. Uh, there are boot camps you can go through, uh, and there are many different ways to change your career any time in life. And by the way, we encourage you to do it because after you've done that, you will be more employable, you will have a higher salary, more guaranteed a job, etc., etc. So I'd love to see a campaign like that, but the question is just who has the capacity to reach the largest audience uh, in that? Uh, the, the, the <laughs> it's interesting because you are in the know about um, career advice, you, that's your, you know, you, but there, there, there is career, there are, there are organisations like the Careers Enterprise Company, uh, there's a national career service, but the fact that it's unknown, it's, I think, quite telling. These are sort of government-supported initiatives, and career advice generally has been <coughs> underwhelming for so many years, and it is a, a, definitely a big challenge. How can you, how can you have an up-to-date, real-time hub of information that anyone in this room or anyone in school can rely on to know what, they, what options there are and how do they get to that path? And that is, that is the opportunity, because te technology can, can help us with that. And I think, I mean, most of us who were, um, went to school in the UK will have realised that careers advice might have been tick a box and it says, oh, you like um, working outdoors and you like nature, well, maybe become a lumberjack even if you live in central London. <laughs> so careers advice has been patchy in the UK, I guess, mm. at best. Um, I guess we're, we're going to start wrapping up, so I wonder if I can ask the panel for any sort of final comments in terms of, OK, we've talked about how radical we need to be. Um, but that, that takes time, um, and what we heard very from the very start um, from Dirk was actually the pace and the scale of this change is going to happen quickly and hit us fast and then keep hitting us. So what is there that we can do as individuals or to take back to the companies that we work in today to, to help change the culture, if not, or change our practice to make sure that we are um, more open to reskilling? George. Yeah. I like the lumberjack thing. I think it recommended that I was a fish farmer, um, but I quite, I quite <laughs> like that too. But, um, so yeah, I think in terms of what we can do, the, the key things for me are about, in the first instance, making incremental changes uh, to start to nudge at what I think is a far bigger set of cultural changes, which will come about only through action. Um, I think that it's all well and good us sort of um, thinking about, for instance, changes through schools, for instance, but... Um, they're, they're very um, historically rooted uh, institutions and organisations that are going to be quite difficult to change without a broader movement behind them. Um, I mean, I think it's important that, again, I'll come back to this sort of <coughs> access to information. Um, we uh, should be providing appropriate information through uh, people at all stages of that sort of pipeline, whether they're in work or looking to get into work or in school. Um, and when it comes to sectors, we know we did some research with LinkedIn that 36% of people that were in the tech sector had come from outside of tech. We know it can happen, but we need to unpick how that happens and then give people that information. So coming from an insights perspective, I think from, for, for me, the way that I can have an input into this debate is by providing that information. Um, and I would love to be part of a coalition that did start to, I guess, make that information on a massive scale far more accessible. So. Uh, if there is a way that we could make that happen, given that we've got lots of people in the room here today uh, that are going to be vested or have a vested interest in this area, then we should talk about it further and think about how through the support of government, businesses, and through the people in this room, we can start to, to, to nudge at making that happen. 
I have three quick asks, one for individuals, four companies and for co government, um, and touching on different topics we've talked about. For individuals, uh, the, the thing about diversity and changing culture and getting girls interested in this, if you know a young girl in your family or, or in your group of friends, if you know someone who has a girl or you have a daughter yourself, give them a science toy. Just anything to get them curious and excited about science and what that is. Very easy, number one. For companies, my ask would be that HR departments dare to take a few more risks in their hiring, be a bit more open-minded about looking at profiles that are not your standard profile. Doesn't, a data scientist doesn't have to be someone who's already worked as a data scientist for two years. It can be an opera singer who took a training program and they will be brilliant in your job because they are super committed. So be a bit more open-minded in, in recruitment. And for government, I would love to see more support for private training in, initiatives. University education takes years to change, but uh, organizations like myself, and there are many others like, like me who try to, to build training programs, we can change our curriculum from one month to the next to suit whatever the, the companies are interested in at that point. But we get pretty, virtually no support from government <coughs> for our work. So a little bit more support in, in whatever way possible from government would be much appreciated. So that's my three asks. Right. Uh, I'm going to build on, uh, on Kim's model of three, if, I don't, if that's all right. And um, starting with uh, all of you, I don't know if you are already employed or you are looking to be employed in the sector, but, but certainly no matter your age, your gender, and what your backgrounds are, as we've heard from in terms of, you know, lumberjacks and <laughs> software singers, that you could be, have a great career in, in, in this field, in AI and, and data science. And, and the apprenticeship model is there um, for the taking. And it's, it, there are some apprentices who are 70 years old, and you can start at 16 years old. And there are 3 million who have qualified as apprentices in the last um, few years. And it's, it is a revolution. So if you are thinking about your next career move, Look at employers who are looking to hire apprentices. Don't just think it's for the manual trades and don't think it's just for a, a wet behind the ears 18 year old. It's for, it's for everyone. Um, my advice to employers is really building on what you're saying, be open. Um, it is not just about hiring from the, 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 you know, the Russell Group universities. There, are, there is a talent pool out there not just in terms of apprentices, but also those that have kind of neurodiversity, who might be dyslexic or dyspraxic. They have, they've got extraordinary creative skills that, that, that those who don't have learning needs don't have. So just widen your mind to the opportunities there. And I think also, finally, to, to government. Um, we were talking about this, George, just this, we have to, uh, uh, we have, there's urgency here. You know, we have a great opportunity to be world class in, 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 this, in this country. We've got, you know, the, the Prime Minister yesterday was talking about being the, the other than China and the, the States, being the best place to have an AI business, to, have, to be a unicorn business. We have to marry that with a skill system which is still very, very antiquated. And so the time is now, and it's going to, if we don't do it now, it, we'll, miss, we'll miss a vote. Absolutely, Ms. Hasher. Um, yeah, so I wanted to slightly flip it. I think that there's, there's really exciting things we can do with data and AI, um, and more organisations should be making the most of these technologies. And when we did our work, we found that something like 14% of uh, companies in the UK were either using or thinking about using AI. And that can probably grow. Um, and I know government is investing in enabling companies to adopt these technologies. And adoption needs to involve uh, both adoption of the technologies, it needs to involve getting your data right, getting your data in good condition, and it needs to involve all this upskilling. Because it's not just a kind of a challenge created by the technology that we need the skills to meet. It's a really exciting thing we can do with these technologies. So I think it's not just about individuals having the right skills. It's about companies and organisations being ready to take on the technologies and to build the people that can make the most of them. Perhaps I'll just say a few words about where I think perhaps we can help as well in this context because I think there's lots of ha things happening in the UK itself. Um, I think one is what we try to do in a lot of areas is trying to see, well, what's the evidence out there? What are the, some of the skills where, that we need? What are some of the gaps that we have? 
as well, and what can we learn by, by looking at each other. I think the other thing is about examples, good practices. I think we're all trying to solve the same problem, and I think we can learn a lot from each other just by, by saying, not because it will always work in the same way, but because I think there are, we need inspiration, we need ideas, and we need things that can be scaled. So I think, I think that's, that's, that's really crucial. Third thing is, I think, action. We're working with lots of countries at the moment to try and work through the, the issue, trying to understand, well, what's the problem that they're facing? What can we learn from each other? How can we move forward? So we're helping countries in terms of, of, of rethinking their adult training system in, 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 in some cases already. And I think the final thing is, I think this is all part of a broader agenda. I think skills is crucial. It's a crucial part of it. But there is this big digital transition, this big tech transition that's coming our way. And skills is part of the solution, but it's not the only part. And I think we need to also sometimes get a little bit out of our boxes, our, our areas of, of where, which we're working on, and try to see the big picture, try to work on the big picture, because I think we all, uh, there are lots of things to do. Uh, and, and skills is a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. So I think we need to look at that broader agenda too. So, I mean, the, the scale of the challenge is enormous, and I think that sometimes can lead us into inaction and paralyze us. But I hope from what you've heard from the panelists today has inspired you, but also given you some active um, and very practical things that you can go away and start thinking about and actioning within your own companies or influencing others to start making that difference now. So please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.